Senior Symposium. Today we're going to have Ryan and Zach present their work on private blockchain. Um, I'd invite you to make sure your phones, one last check, are on vibrate or silent, um, just so we don't disturb our presenters. I'm Zach Shaver. I'm Ryan Rambillis. And our advisor is Dr. Emil Salid for this capstone project. So we'll be talking about, uh, um, go through a little background on our project. All right, first is the background. Four characteristics of a blockchain system is the first is decentralized. Our current system is you have one admin or agency in control of it, and the people who are using it are just at the will of their verification. The second is a distributed ledger, and this is when nodes, or you can just think of them as people with these dots, it's the distribution. So every single person or node has access to the data. So if a server, Amazon server goes down, that the whole entire network is not affected. A third characteristic is it's immutable, meaning in our current system, you have no way of telling if those Gucci glasses are fake or if they're real. With the blockchain, you can trace back a product all the way from the beginning of where it was sold. And then the last is consensus driven. The current system derives value on the trust that our dollar will stay strong. Our system is that trust is built on the agreement between, well, or consensus, the agreement between the participants of the chain. Okay, I'll be going about talking about our opportunity um, that we took to complete this project. So basically, uh, blockchain's uh, technology is very abstract and complex to the public um, and the community as a whole. So what we took um, on uh, doing this project was trying to dimensify um, the underlining technology behind blockchain, blockchain as undergraduate students. Um, and we did this um, also by delivering uh, hands-on lab report um, exercises so other students and peers um, could uh, build forward on um, our uh, capstone project. So next we're going to talk about the solution. So the, our opportunity was again the capstone we did and the solution to this was two part. One was creating a private blockchain network compared to the public side of things. Right now the public network is Ethereum and the, there was no center uh, private blockchain network where students could get a hands-on experience was how it, it was built. And the second was the four exercises we delivered. This delivers a step-by-step -step guide on how to implement this chain and get more in-depth analysis on how it works. All right, I'll um, talk about uh, a little bit about our design. So this is a, go in a little quick cap on the design of the blockchain, the architect of it. So we had two nodes. Each node is, again, just a person. Each node has an account, just like when you access Amazon website or you sign on Netflix, you have to have an account. Each node has to have, back to the distributed ledger, each node has to have the set of data to continue. And then when an account, say you wanted to buy something, you interact with a contract called a smart contract. And you have to pay a fee, but this fee, just like if you're buying property, it doesn't go to a agency, a realtor agency, it would go to the community. And this is the incentive for miners to use their energy and verify a transaction. Once the transaction is verified, it comes in a block, and this block is added to a ledger. And this is where, when we said it's immutable, it has a cryptographic link from the first block to the current block. And then once it's updated into the ledger, all nodes must get the current block uh, added to their ledger. All right, I'll start by um, uh, talking about how we implemented and going about uh, completing this project. So what we had to start with first is creating the genesis block. Basically what the genesis block is, is the um, origin block um, of the blockchain. Like uh, Zach said uh, previously, that the blockchain um, uh, happens when uh, or it takes the information from the previous block and um, uses that to build the next block. So this is what the um, blockchain consists of, the uh, building block of it. Uh, we chose to do the private versus the public um, side of uh, blockchain things because uh, we could um, dictate the parameters and change uh, the configurations um, of our blockchain using the Genesis block um, rather than if we were to do this project on the public side, the Genesis block was already built for us and the parameters were already uh, specified and um, hard-coded into their blockchain. Um, and as you can see, um, our uh, Genesis block only consisted of a couple of uh, lines of code. Um, on the public side, their Genesis block uh, can consist of hundreds of thousands of lines of code. 
Um, next, after we created uh, our Genesis block, we had to start by implementing nodes. Um, nodes are needed for uh, any blockchain to work. Um, a node is a de uh, any device that is connected to the blockchain. Um, the nodes are basically the foundations of the technology because without uh, a node running the blockchain, your blockchain wouldn't be able to run. Um, and as you can see on the right hand side, uh, this little picture is a picture of uh, many nodes. And the way blockchain works is that it's um, decentralized and distributed. So if one of these nodes that were all interconnected together were to go down, uh, you wouldn't be losing any data um, from uh, any of your blockchains. Um, the way we are, uh, and actually in this um, slide, you see many nodes um, connected together, but the way we implemented it on <coughs> our project was only having two nodes. Um, and as you can see in this uh, it's a little network diagram, um, we have two nodes, one node, two nodes, and they basically represent um, two machines in two uh, different physical places. Um, the first node was set to be in America, and the second node uh, was set to be in China. Um, this is uh, a piece of code, um, just to give you guys an idea of what we have to go through of um, how to pair both nodes and uh, connect them together. So next, we're talking about accounts. Just like any well, website you, for a portal, you need an account to access data and interact with it. The, in blockchain, all accounts are created equally, because right, we said it's decentralized, distributed. There's no admin to the system. Every account, nothing special about a miner compared to someone who's just a regular user. You just get the equipment and you become a miner. And then, and like, uh, addresses, you're given one when it's first created. And it's not like a Netflix account where you can reset the password. You, get, you put a password in when you first create it, and then if you lose it, it's gone. So any value you acquire <coughs> on that account and that chain is lost. We don't know exactly where it goes. But it's still on the blockchain because it's in the ledger, but the account, there's no one who can access it. And here is a demo to show you the front end. So this is MetaMask. And MetaMask is a wallet manager used for much of the big cryptocurrencies. All right, so this is, it's usually connected to the public side, but we connected it to our local node. So right here, I'm importing an account. You don't make an account on the node. The account is already created. And then you have to type in your password. If you get this wrong, again, you cannot import your account. All right, then I'm gonna send a transaction. This, is, this transaction doesn't have to always be money, but in this case, it was money. So the transaction fee, this is the gas fee I pay to the community to have the incentive for other participants to mine the transaction. All right, and this address is on another node, it could be anywhere. It just has to be connected to our chain, our private chain. Gas fee total. This is pending. A transaction, just like when you try and send money from one account to another account on a bank, it doesn't just straight go to it. This is the process of it be a third party not involved in the transaction. The transaction has to be verified. There has to be a consensus given for the transaction to become a block, which would which would show a transfership of a property happen. All right, so that's again just to show you that like, this is the process. It does, this is the end product, <clears throat> but it was a lot more complex than that. So here again, see the transaction. A transaction was created when he tried to send it. It was submitted to the chain. This gives the opportunity to other participants to mine, and they would get paid the gas fee, which would happen by one account sending the, the to the community the fee. And then once it's confirmed, this is after the mining happens, so the verification has happened, and then it is added to the ledger, and from there, all the nodes have to update their ledger with the newest block. I'll be talking about how we implemented um, a smart contract on our blockchain. So smart contracts, um, So smart contracts basically um, help blockchains um, exchange uh, anything of value. This value could be either money, property, shares, or a service. Um, basically what the smart contract does is it eliminates the need for a middleman. Um, so if you were to buy a plot of uh, land, you would need to go through an agency, a realtor, something like that. Um, 
the way that we're going to be uh, demoing it is on our blockchain, there is no need for a middleman and no need for um, an authoritative figure to um, verify that the ownership between two uh, land properties um, are valid. All right, so transactions. This is a smart contract. It's just a transaction that was already previously in a block that all participants <coughs> can access. So it's like he was saying, it's not just monetary. In our demo, we use a land marketplace, marketplace, DAP, and <clears throat> it has to be verified when the transaction goes, just like any other system. This time, it's distributed. The verification happens through a consensus from all the nodes. And this, uh, our consensus we use, there's many out there. We chose proof of work, because this is most famous with Ethereum and Bitcoin. And proof of work, all the nodes are, if you're a miner, you're competing to solve a mathematical problem. And the first one to uh, solve it gets the fee that the first user, I sell on the MetaMask, submits to the community. All right, I'll be going uh, into our first demo of our land application, decentralized application that we created. Okay, so first, um, what we need to do is we need to log in to our blockchain um, using one of the accounts that we created on one of these nodes. So here, um, an account is logging into the blockchain. Um, now we, uh, now the uh, co smart contract address is needed. Um, this uh, contract address was deployed to our blockchain by a third party participant. Um, and we are going to be interacting with it from a separate account and a separate node. So this account is going to attempt to buy this plot of land. Um, and as you can see, um, once he uh, clicks buy right here, um, in the console it says submitted transaction. So what's going on behind the scenes while this is happening is that uh, other participants on our blockchain, the miners, um, they're going to need to uh, start competing against each other to solve this, ver uh, this mathematical problem to verify that this transaction is valid. So once, he start, once the mining starts behind the scenes from another third party, you can see that this buy on the left-hand side is going to um, change to sell. As you can see, it just happened right there. So once that hap that buy changed to sell, that ultimately uh, verified that um, the plot of ownership has changed. Now what I'm uh, going to do is I'm going to submit a second um, transaction, and I'm going to put this newly bought uh, plot of land that I've just bought, and I'm going to sell it. Um, I so I bought it for four thousand, but I'm going to be very generous, and I'm going to put it up for sale for one thousand. Everyone can get a piece of this land. And then, as you can see, once I submitted the transaction, um, the, uh, the mining behind the scenes starts happening by other third party participants. And once, the, uh, once that transaction has been verified, you can see that it says take plot off the market, which ultimately, ultimately verified again that now I have ownership of that plot. All right. In our second demo, we're going to be doing that first, um, as previously in that uh, first demo, um, that was one node, one account. That node was uh, placed in um, America. Now we're going to be on our second node with our second account, and this node is in completely different places, but it's still going to be interacting with the same blockchain. Now we're going to um, log in to, our, to the blockchain using uh, a different account. Once we're logged in, once that account is logged into the blockchain, it it needs to uh, get the uh, get access to the um, smart contract. And as we said before, all nodes are both of the nodes are connected. So once we deploy the smart contract on the blockchain, um, we can automatically get access to it from our second account because it's already connected to the blockchain. Okay. And as you can see, once we um, logged into the blockchain, it's kind of blurry, so I'm sorry. But uh, from a, the first account in the first demo, it says for sale 1,000. And as you can see in all these others, uh, it says 4,000. This is because account one now owns that plot, and he put it up for sale for 1,000. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to submit a transaction um, as a second account on a different node to buy, buy this plot of land from the first account. Okay. Once I submit the, once I hit buy, it submits a transaction. 
and behind the scenes, all the third party participants that are on our blockchain, again, they're um, competing against each other to solve this uh, mathematical equation. And once they have um, solved it and ultimately verified the transaction, you can see that the buy has now changed to sell and uh, there's no more for sale because now I am the ownership, or that account is the owner of that block or plot of land. So next we're going to talk about our results. So the two main things we focused on to get out of this project was hands-on lab format exercises and the other was VMs that we could pass down to future students. The VMs were very important because like we, when we started, we didn't have anything to go off of and we were just, first like four or five weeks, figuring out how to just set up one node to verify a transaction. The hands-on uh, exercises are important because there's not real documentation out there on uh, for the up one updated version and two just what is going on behind the scenes like we were showing everything we had this we saw the DAP picture I would say like first semester and we didn't get to it until about three four weeks ago we had to go through the grunt work first. All right, and now we're talking about the uh, assessment. Um, basically, our um, experience um, of what we. Uh, went through our journey of uh, completing this two-year um, semester, uh, semester, uh, not semester, uh, capstone pro uh, project. Um, it was very uh, difficult. Um, I would say my experience between time management, managing um, a full course load, um, and then trying to uh, get a grasp of this very complex technology um, as an undergraduate student, which was very hard because like we said before, there wasn't, there's not that many um, documentation on how uh, this technology works that could be interpreted by uh, an undergrad. I would say my biggest experience is, <clears throat> I would say it was a great journey. It was stumped during it, the uh, actual doing part, but once we figured out how to finish it and we became part of the GitHub and over, Overflow communities because we contributed to those two sites, and then this will be contributed to future students, it feels good that other people are going to have a way to learn about blockchain quicker and faster because there is a steep learning curve. I mean, behind the CCC, all hundreds of commands would be eth dot whatever, eth dot whatever, and we wouldn't understand that until a little bit into it. Um, so we'll be talking about uh, where we go next um, on continuing this journey. So first would be explore other consistent algorithms. Like we we did proof of work, but there's a lot more out there. It's proof of authority. Ethereum's about to switch to proof of stake. Proof of work was very easy to, I would say one of the easiest to understand because that is the only documentation as limited as it is. It's all about proof of work. There's nothing else out there. Other senses. Um, we'd also uh, want to uh, implement this private blockchain on a different platform, such as Bitcoin. Um, because the one reason why we chose Ethereum was that it gave us uh, an easier way um, to say on how to uh, play around with the uh, blockchain attributes on the private side rather than going on the public side, which Bitcoin lives on the public blockchain. The third, what's next for future students could uh, tackle is looking at the blockchain security. We didn't get a bunch of chance because we were setting up the actual blockchain private network. How it's encrypted is, like we said earlier, it's a cryptographically linked from the Genesis block to the most current block, and we would like to see if it is as secure as they say, if we can't try and fake a transaction and they would catch it. Um, another thing we'd want to look at is um, other Ethereum protocols. So um, a big tool that we use is Wireshark, which allows us to uh, basically see the flow of um, uh, packets and internet protocols that uh, blockchain uses and we only uh, were able to see one or two protocols on um, basically the rules of what blockchain uh, Ethereum uses and uh, right now we are just trying to uh, dive deeper into the the more complex uh, like algorithms and um, mathematical uh, computations that Ethereum offers. Let's do closing remarks. So we'd like to acknowledge Dr. Salid for helping us out through this two-year project. He gave us guidance, and anytime we were feeling frustrated, he would talk us down and say, it's okay, we got this, just one step at a time. Um, we'd also like to thank our lab manager, Safa. Um, he gave us uh, an opportunity to get the equipment 
and um, helped us through the uh, way with little things uh, such as uh, configuring a VM or, or um, trying to connect to the network. And lastly, we'd like to show much appreciation for the online community's GitHub and Stack Overflow. These communities help us troubleshoot problems that weren't anywhere else we could find, and then they actually reply to our posts, and we contributed to them. That was pretty cool. Any questions? Any questions? Any question? Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Sorry, oh, no, no. <laughs> Zach called it a day. Okay. <laughs> no, no, not yet. <laughs> so, uh, how do you think like a decentralized ledger would help with the privacy? Does it increase the privacy of users? It decreases it. How does it affect privacy? Okay, we didn't look too much for privacy, but what we encountered, but you still can't tell who was using it. You get the address. It's like a 128-bit address, and then you have a. a password you input in when you first make it, which encrypts it. So when you're interacting with other accounts on the chain, you don't really know who's behind it. So can, can anyone still verify the transaction, just like current ledger, or it's going to be different? Yeah, anyone can verify except the people that are inside the transaction. So if I'm account one and you're account two and I s uh, send you property, I can't mine my own and you can't mine your own. A third party does, or another participant on that chain. So some of the um, audience are high school students, and so I'm wondering what kind of equipment would they need if you were going to do one of your hands-on demonstrations? So we had, we only need actually one host, so like any desktop and then VMware, and we were using Ubuntu, just standard VM, and then we download the Ethereum, pro, or Ethereum software, and then that right there, you just start it up, and then you already have built-in functions. What we built was you have to do the Genesis block, and all that's done is just, it's not really tangible, so it's... You don't need that much equipment or that much hardware. A lot of it is done by executing uh, just lines of code and downloading the proper uh, packages and software. But yeah, usually uh, it, it could be done with uh, just a desktop and uh, a virtual machine. And all free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ethereum is open source, so they have a community that gives back to them and keeps it going. Is it my understanding you were saying something about the password? If you mm -hmm. lose the password, do you automatically lose the information, or does that information still safe? It's on the chain, because like I said, it's immutable, so no one can go back and change that information. But you can't, if you lose your password, there's no reset button. It's not like Netflix where you can just bring your password, send your email, because it's not on email. It's an address that's encrypted by the password you submit. So once it's encrypted, you need to decrypt it to get access to the chain through the node. So like, with what you just add, so when you, you can't reset your password, so basically, like what happens with all that data? Well, we don't know, but blockchains have an end date, so if we look at Bitcoin, the Bitcoin end date is 2090, so then it's already accumulating a lot of value, it's, I'm guessing that just because I forget my password all the time, that accounts can't be accessed, so the value stays on the chain because energy was used to mine, but it, maybe it's redistributed after the chain ends, it just stays in the system. That's the I mean, downside, you lose your password. You know, another thing, if another user gets your password, they own your account. So if I know your password and I put it in with your address, then I have all your value. I have any old properties you have. If I may add, that's one of the reasons why the chain technology or the blockchain technology was created in such a way that you wouldn't be able to retrieve passwords. Because if you do, then you have a way by which you can go into the transactions and figure out what's happening. And the whole idea is to keep it so closed that not even you, once you lose the password, be able to figure it out. Because if you do figure it out, the whole chain is corrupted, meaning it's becoming now exposed. So that's the whole concept of it, is to be totally closed and no one able to break in so easily. And going off that, when you reset your account on other companies' websites, that's because they have a central server. This, everyone has account, your name and your, or not your name, but your account and your value. So if you reset it, like he was saying, that would have to, everyone would have to update their notes. That's why it's hard to commit fraud on blockchain, because every single person that's participating in the chain has access to the ledger. You can see what, it, what it, the data is supposed to look like.
Yeah, just giving the uh, the password a reset uh, button um, as allows anybody a backdoor into um, any information that's uh, distributed on the blockchain. Okay, so what I'd like to, just a few remarks, I, I want to thank uh, uh, both Zach and Ryan for a, a great job in actually um, breaking into a technology that I, I have to admit at the beginning when I was interacting with them, I didn't even understand what they, what they were doing. I really didn't. I mean, I, I was struggling. I mean, they were struggling. I was actually struggling, not for them, but I was struggling for actually even understanding what they're doing. And gradually, which uh, it, it speaks very highly of them, by the way, we chipped away, like the mining, we chipped away on getting to the point where they and I were able to communicate with words that is meaningful to both of us to begin with. Uh, so eventually I got it and thank to them for really their persistence to be able to keep answering the question I had, but actually come to the end of it with a product that I'm so proud of in actually be them being able to understand the guts of what goes on. It, it's a remarkable journey. I don't think even they understand the significance of what they have accomplished because they are still under the pressure of getting done. Yeah, then they haven't realized how wonderful job they've done. Ryan, wonderful job.